Weird. Uh, hey, how's it going, guys? Hey. Come on. Hey. 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 Oh. hey. This is me, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey. Uh, so. Um, right. No. <laughs> That's why I was like. I got up and it's like, this is super weird. What are you guys doing? You know, this is where pictures are taken. All right. Um, so yeah, so my name is Matt Oswalt. Um, I am uh, that guy. And I wanted to get up here and sort of talk about um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, network automation, network, um, you know, uh, pulling data from the network and using that data to do meaningful things. Um, I don't really have anything to present, unfortunately. I think what I really would love to do is to sort of just start that conversation in the room. Um, so there is a participation grade after the fact. Keep that in mind. Um, I don't have ribbons. They're all, you know, invisible virtual ribbons. You'll have to just deal with that. All right, he has Tech Field Day, tech field day stickers he's going to give out. Um, but just a little bit about me. Um, uh, I, I do, I, I, you know, I did network consulting for a long time, network engineering, you know, traditional stuff. Um, for a number of years. Uh, before that, though, I was involved uh, with really not that. Um, in fact, right after, uh, during and, and immediately after college, uh, I dealt with a lot of just raw application development. Um, I even actually sort of accidentally got into networking because I was doing application development for uh, a voice over IP project that I was working on at the time. Um, and so I sort of just m accidentally fell into this, uh, this world. And so ever since then, I've sort of been trying to bridge the gaps between my two skill sets. And I think um, I've started to do more of that lately, um, uh, not just with respect to network automation, but just with building apps and, and, and building, um, building platforms that allow uh, people to think about their infrastructure in more meaningful ways other than um, I'm on a CLI typing on a single box, that kind of stuff. I, I, I don't think of networks as boxes anymore, and I don't think anybody should uh, either. I, I like to think of these things as, as single systems, um, and you should interact with those systems in the way that is most meaningful to you. Um, so uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. But honestly, uh, most of this is our questions that I have for you. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna see how that works out. Um, before I get into those questions, though, um, I will make use of this little tool. Would you like me to move this so it's easier to see? I think that's easier. Oh, okay, cool. All right. So today, with respect to and this, the title of this talk is network management. Um, open discussion about network management. So well, I would be remiss if I did not put these two acronyms on the board. That's pretty much. Um, you done. You done now? <laughs> good, good talk. SDN, right? SDN too. List complete. Yeah. Oh, and SDN. We'll get to that. All right. So, so yeah. So this is, this is pretty much it, right? And, and even within this, th there's a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of separation between roles, right? We don't really use these two tools for the same thing. Uh, we use one tool for configuration and one tool for, well, not configuration, even though the authors probably would have liked it, but um, we just don't. Um, anybody here using SNMP for anything other than monitoring? Read only. Yeah, so uh, that, is, uh, that is the way things are today. Um, but as you get into, I mean, if you, if you think about Again, thinking about your network as a system, you start to think about um, the different components. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that started this trend of improving that list uh, was we're now adding more um, diverse sets of components to our network. We're now no longer thinking of our network in terms of boxes. Uh, we, we also might think of um, things as uh, services. Uh, for instance, um, you know, I, I, I don't think of um, you know, IP <coughs> tables as a firewall, I think of it as a service I can query uh, and set parameters on and things like that. And then, of course, at scale, I want to I query thousands of instances of IP tables, things like that. And, and, and if, you think of, if you start thinking about your network in those terms, you need more tools and better tools to, to properly look at those things. I mean, we can't, uh, SNMP was a good attempt. We can't necessarily use CLI for those kind of things. And, um, and so uh, I wanted to put some other tools on the board, so, uh, some things that I've been using lately. Um, that uh, I would like for us to at least sort of talk about. Um, let's just start with the simple stuff. Uh, old. Uh, we now have, let's just start with the simple stuff. Uh, we have REST APIs, right? And uh, some of the vendors have been introducing the, the concept of a REST API into their uh, devices directly so that we can um, retrieve meaningful data, one of, the, uh, one of those formats being JSON. That's pretty standard, right? Everybody kind of understands what JSON does and why that's better than uh, unstructured text. Both work 
one's just sort of, I guess, more centric to that use case. Um, this is pretty simple. Uh, stateless kind of APIs, those are, those are useful uh, because they're easy, but they're also very limited into some of the things that they can do. Um, let's take a look at uh, the, I'll, I'll call it star flow. Um, uh, because we have different instances of this. We have open, we have net, we have s. Obviously, they do different things. Um, but we have these, these flow-based um, tools um, that allow us to do things at a, at a, at a flow level, uh, dealing with network flows across the, across the infrastructure, um, some of which is used for monitoring, some of which is used for actually doing configurations. Um, like we want to instantiate a flow across the network uh, on a five-tuple, things like that. Um, that's a lot of this is sort of new. I know a lot of us in the room are used to NetFlow specifically. We've at least uh, stood up a NetFlow collector to receive that kind of data and um, do, do meaningful things with that. Um, but there's more, more than meets the eye there. Yeah. I would argue that the NetFlow belongs on the, the existing. So I think enough people use it. Okay. It's, it's pretty yeah, much no, that's fine. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, we use it. It's, it's core to a lot of things we do. And so SFlow and OpenFlow being not nearly as, as used. SFlow maybe. Mm. Could be on the left for some people, but I think predominantly NetFlow is used by a lot of people. All right. So why? Why is why is it different? Why is Bridges this all of a sudden the tool that we're using? Infrastructure and application a little bit mm -hmm. starts to. Okay. Uh, I guess who is making that bridge? Is it is it the network team that's the network team? Okay. So what makes the data that comes out of NetFlow more useful um, to the network team? Uh, that helps them, I guess, bridge the gap with the apps team. How does that enable them to have that conversation? To have a meaningful understanding of, of what's being traversed across the network mm -hmm. as opposed to source destination. It's mm -hmm. an understanding of, of utilization and, and some other metrics that, I mean, that, that, that to me is, is the most meaningful part of it. And well, mean the time to innocence is the other one. Mm -hmm. that's so that's, the kind of, I guess, probably the bigger one really is mean time to innocence. It's the first stab at application insight, right? Right. Well, so I, I have this discussion kind of often. Um, what happens if the application developers don't know what ports their apps are using? You know, I mean, this is this is. Uh, I, I think I agree. It's a good first. It's a good first step. Um, but ultimately, I think the best the best way way to start is where's the use case? Like, who's actually going to be using this data? Um, a better way to think of it is um, if you tie into, and we're looking at this all the time. In fact, um, I was just, I came from uh, KubeCon a, a week ago. Um, a lot of insight into how um, the, the, you know, these container orchestration systems are creating these services at scale, scale out, and, and creating uh, flow rules from one, say, you know, compute instance to another. Um, th this metadata is there already, and we, we, what we can do is we can say, um, this NetFlow you know, collector or whatever, this sort of instance that we're monitoring this NetFlow data is sort of like that. Um, and there's, there's the where this gets interesting is where those two services sort of play with each other. So instead of like saying, hey, I have this NetFlow report on a piece of paper, your app is using port 80 and it's killing my network. More than that, I think it's useful to be able to link them together um, programmatically instead of human to human, sort of you got like a system to system interaction. I don't know, that's sort of ethereal, but I, I think that's I think that's where this gets really useful when you have services talking to each other in that way. So um, that's so that's cool. NetFlow will put in the I guess old column. Old is bad. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, oh, so this is interesting. I'm using this a lot more often. Anybody uh, familiar with pub sub models? Like, uh, let's say I'll just actually write pub sub. Anybody know what I mean when I say that? Mm. Messaging buses. Yeah, pu publish subscribe yeah. is what it yeah. stands for. But yeah. yeah, message bus, message queue, um, things like that. I'll put some examples here. Um, AMQP. Um, that's a very popular example. That's a. Um, uh, if you're familiar with RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ is a is a standards compliant uh, implementation. Have you, have you seen any solutions from the traditional vendors with PubSub APIs? Yeah, actually, um, I'll, I'll sort of finish this list and then I'll answer that question. Um, let's do XMPP. That's another example. I've seen XMPP a lot. Yeah, yeah. And you probably know what, what vendor I'm talking about when I put that on the list. Um, yeah. what, what's... You want old school? On the, you want on the, really on the, old? On the list. Yeah, Tim go Co. for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you've been around for a really long time, you know them. But yeah, yeah. Um, there's another one. I, I, this isn't really. I guess it is kind of pub sub. But um, for those of us used to uh, working with OVS, uh, Open V Switch, um, you have this uh, idea of an OVS DB, which is the protocol, uh, sort of the management protocol for uh, OVS. And there's a specific. RPC within OVSDB that allows you to do monitoring. Um, so what it does is it says whenever there's a configuration change, I'm going to send the diff 
to the OVSDB client, whatever, whatever has called the OVSDB monitor. So it's sort of like a persistent <coughs> read um, on the configuration state. That in particular is super interesting to me um, because we really don't have that equivalent in, in networking other than OVS. I can't think of one. Um, it would be great if, if, uh, if we could do this. Um, because then we can write, what we can do is then we can write remediation software. Hey, uh, you know, I've written this Python script that pushes config to 50 switches. That's fantastic. What happens when Fred logs into switch four uh, and decides to change things? Yeah. Um, yes. So, so yes. <laughs> so, so, so this is, so this, there's, there's a number of, um, and a lot of these questions I've written sort of um, to, to hit on some of these points that I've been thinking about over the past, you know, two years really. Um, Configuration deployment is great. Um, I, I think we could do more there. I think we could do better as a, as a, I guess, a group of folks here in this room to help evangelize how that's done safely and how that's done responsibly. Um, but there are so much more that we could be talking about. Analytics being one of them, just sort of getting using the data that's already in, in your infrastructure. You know, that's 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 one area that's sort of just like a black box today. Still, um, <coughs> in the vast majority of uh, network environments that I've seen or even worked in. The other thing is. Uh, well, I, won't, I don't want to spoil the beans too much, but uh, I, I, I will sort of jump there a little bit because I, it's sort of at the end of my list of questions. But one other thing, one other area that I think we could do better at is um, pre and post change testing. Um, we don't do that at all, neither. Uh, and we could do a lot more there. Um, I'm working on several things in my personal time that uh, hope to solve this problem. And uh, I've been writing about a few of these concepts, but I think we could do a lot, a, a lot more there, specifically with pre-testing, um, and uh, actually post-testing is just as important. Basically, verifying that the change that you made actually took place, and that it's actually doing what you want, not necessarily the, that the config is there. Okay, so without spoiling that too much, um, I will go um, forward into my questions. Uh, the first question: What are you doing to manage your network today, other than that? CLI, SNMP. Let's just leave it at CLI. Is anybody using any tooling today to manage their network other than that? And what, if so? Besides vendor tools, no. All right, so name of, <coughs> vendor tools. Well, name of vendor tool. HP and A, in and MI. Why do you use that? What does that do for you? Monitoring, alerts, mm -hmm. reporting, ticketing. Does that allow you to push config? Yes. Yes, so do you use it for that kind of thing as well? Um, off and on, not consistently. Okay. Um, Anybody else? UCS. And implementations with live action with their action pack suite. Oh, that's a good call. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, yeah. good example. I heard something over here. UCS, that's an easy one. Okay. Glue, same, same bit with live action. Okay. All right. Some of these, a lot of these I've noticed are sort of new-ish. I mean, UCS probably being the older one that's been suggested. Actually, live action's been around for a while. Um, let me ask a di a, a, the question a different way, um, because clearly, even though there were some answers, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect between that and just sort of box by box CLI. What would convince you to manage your network in a way that you never touch the CLI? What do you need to make that happen? Consolidated tools that work on everything. Okay. Uh, work on everything, what do you mean? Uh, vendor agnostic tool. I mean, like TLF tried to be, I sure. guess, would have been a good-ish example. Okay. Well, I would say one thing, too, it, it, I mean, to answer your question, right, is yeah. every every failing I've seen in everything other than the CLI has been that it doesn't, whatever that may be, you, you can't actually access every single feature and nuance you can in the CLI, right? You'll get 90% of the way there. If you try and do something kind of fun, oh, feature out. Yeah, exactly. 100% right. feature parity. I mean, right. everything, right? Down to every little hidden command that you can get to, right? That's that's first. So the API only exposes sort of a subset of what you're able to do on the CLI. Right. And so, you know, at the late night window, you have to implement some sort of MPLS thing. You can't do it. Yeah. Um, except for being on the CLI. That's a good point. What else? What else would help? I'd say the what the tools written too would make a difference to me. Really? How so? Well, I mean, there's tools, configuration tools, like you look at some of the stuff that's written in Java, mm -hmm. all, you know, and now I'm, I'm dealing with versioning on different You know, machines. the Netflix guy is still are we, here. Are we talking about SDM? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how about no Java? That would be, that would be one thing that would convince me. We're <laughs> yeah. complaining about the ASDM now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never I know said it. it. I never I said it. it. <laughs> yeah, there's another guy behind you, too. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I kind of see. I can't see what you're saying. I think 
it's not necessarily about the language from my perspective. It would be more just about the user experience in general, yeah. like yeah. what that forces you to do. I don't really care what language it's built in. As long as it works and as long as it doesn't force me to download an applet and do all that garbage, then you know, that's fine. Um, but yeah, all good points. I think, I, th I think the user experience is a very good thing to think about. Um, you know, if, 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 I mean, we've got tons of, tons of things to do, um, some of which is attend meetings, um, but I think a, a, lot of, a lot of that can be simplified if we had the proper uh, tooling that doesn't, it, we don't begrudge, that we don't not look forward to, to um, you know, to work with. So any other, any other, any other benefits of, of moving away from the CLI that, would, that you would see? Well, another thing, I don't want, I don't want something that's going to make me feel like I'm an idiot, right? That I want to be able to touch the stuff. I, right. You know, I don't want just, oh, click a button, it's done for you. I mean, oh, I what's it doing? Yeah. You don't want the big if this, then that buttons. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, it, there's a, I think there's a, there's, a little bit of a, there's a little bit of balance to be struck there because I think... Um, we, we, we don't do enough, um, as an industry, I think we don't do enough user experience. Now, we're getting a lot better at this lately, I, it should, I should say that. Um, but just in the past, it, it's, been, um, it's been so focused on the fact that the human being is the only thing interacting with this system, because we're just th that base assumption. Um, so everything sort of builds on top of that. Instead of, we might be interacting with um, this device as a system, build the user experience sort of a level above that. I think that, that that assumption sort of throws things off a little bit. One of the things too is just multi-vendor support, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's just given you know, given every environment out there, you're going to have multiple vendors in terms of switching, f security, again, firewall, you know, whatever it is, and to use a common tool set that needs to, out of the box, to some extent, be able to support those kinds of environments. Mm -hmm. Sure, makes sense. Obvious, but you know. yeah, I, I think it depends. The whole thing depends on. I'm going to use the word paradigm, help me. Um, it depends on what your aim is with this. If the yeah. aim is, I wish to use some other system to do what I would have done on the CLI anyway and just to do tasks a different way, mm -hmm. I think we're kind of missing the point of where we should be going. Right. right. And this is the same thing with automation in general is, well, it's great to write your expect script and run out the same crap you would have done before, but where did the code come from? Well, you wrote it and just threw it in an expect script. There's no win there. Well, maybe a little titty win, but it's not a it's not a big win, right? The the big paradigm shift is when we stop thinking about it as lots of indiv individual boxes that we push config onto, and we start looking at as a wider system, how do we integrate the network as a resource, right. the same way we look at computers as a resource and storage right. as a resource, and start thinking of things in terms of you know we've been. I've been talking at work about firewall policies and how we want to move away from talking about IP addresses and start talking about applications and service ports, and that kind of thing, and define a rule in terms of business policies. Mm -hmm. And it also means that when you add another server to an application, it's great, it just gets pushed out. You don't have to go and add another firewall rule for an IP. And that's to me where the change is. So how that gets accomplished, whether the bottom line is you're still logging into an, a CLI or, or otherwise, in some respects, I don't care. Mm -hmm. But whatever happens, you need visibility of the whole system. You need a huge understanding of what's on your network. Um, and I think so any time you pull away from CLIs or you know, that, that hands-on thing that we like, if you can give me the same information a different way, maybe I don't mind so much, mm -hmm. but I've got to have all the information there. So well, go, go for it. Well, I was just going to say one of the things, right, is is if you, um, I mean, it depends what the goal is, right? So if you could get the network to the point where you're defining policies, you're defining routing policies, you're defining things that you want to have happen, and then you can scale out your, your bandwidth needs or your, your uh, computational needs on the network by simply cabling in a new box, right? Yeah. And, and your rule set is still the same, right? End to end, the system now recognizes that there is another box it can load balance to. There's another, you know, so similar to what we're doing in compute. If you could get to that kind of a point, especially then I think automation and scripting and, and I mean however you want to look at it right would be incredibly valuable because yeah. now you take a step back and you're looking at the holistic you know yeah. what you're trying to accomplish right whereas now we actually have to think box by box by box right I think to some extent though that's a little bit I mean I get what you're saying but I, I look at network as a road a lot of the time right or the plumbing like that everybody says that the same metaphor right but how much of the network actually needs to be automatic I mean like self you know uh, like a all these leaf spine fabrics, right? Auto provision, and you configure one thing, and it's all across everything: ACI, Contrail, New Wash, whatever. It doesn't matter. That I get. Um, 
But I mean, outside of treating the network as one network, I don't know that you need to automate to like minutia, right? Because you're just going to configure your network and then you're going to do all your services at the edge just like a traditional MPLS. Well, yeah, well, I think where do you find, where's, where's the network edge, right? So to me, it's well, the services yeah, layer is, the, is what needs to be orchestrated. I call it exactly. the services yeah. layer. Yeah. Firewalls yeah. and load balancers do all the, the complex stuff. The network the, the, what moves right. the packets, the plumbing. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. How often do you spin up, a, really, do you spin up VLANs, VRFs, Never. routes? Not that often, Never. really. Yeah. It's, it's the services layer, and this is what I, I focus yeah. on, is that services layer and automating that. That's the hard part. Yeah. But I will say, yeah. I mean, think about this, though. One of the things we end up doing all the time, and, and I mean, I end up doing it, we, you know, we've, all of us in the network side have been there. You, you set up a new network, or, or you're helping to have a company grow their network or whatever. What do you have to think of? You have to think of ter in terms of, of current bandwidth needs, but you also have to think about future you know, what kind of growth are you going to get over the next two or three years? So what are we doing? We're buying boxes that are here in order to get bandwidth here on the presumption that we're going to actually grow to here, right? So if you could actually eliminate that and go down here where you're scaling out as needed, pop in a new box, pop in a new box, pop in a new box, then you don't have to buy at this level. You can buy at this level and as your needs, you know, so I think that's... That would be valuable, right? If you could get, and that takes more than just automation. I mean, there's there's other components in there. Obviously, you have to have a unified fabric of seeing and be able to. There's some do resistance that. to that because of the discipline you have to have around your your capacity management, and that that's. The yeah. Well, no, there's always resistance. Yeah, I th I think it's similar resistance to what we find or what we saw in the in the compute space too, though, right? Moving to blades, moving to automation, moving to you know, I think Fair that's I, I think there's a lot of engineers like, that are pushing back on some of this. Yeah, so it gets to that full you know the you know the holy grail of automation. You know, the thing's going to take time. But one of the things again, like telemetry is is a great first start with. I just call it you know general data collection. You know, automate something and I've talked to customers in the past about getting serial numbers of the blades in a in an old school chassis because I said him he would only give you back the serial number of, of the chassis itself but not the blades inside. And leveraging call it automation but leveraging you know CLI or SNMP or the API, you know, it's a great first step to see what can be done and get introduced to what's on the right, you know, the right side there. But in general, you know, gathering stats and telemetry data is is, you know, in general, I think, you know, where we should be going and, and, and once we have all that data, we can do some cool things in terms of, you know, seeing, you know, you know, what can be done going forward from that, right? Sure. Well, I think I think one of the things that's missing <laughs> the discussion is you have different needs for different groups, right? Yeah. I mean, like enterprise and campus design has totally different needs in data center design versus totally different needs from web scale, totally different needs from cloud scale. I mean, I, I think part of the challenge for what we're presenting, I mean, if you're dealing with Kubernetes and, and Mesos, right? <laughs> your yeah, requirements campus. are completely different than well, if I you're dealing with someone who's... my campus, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> you're totally different needs than what you're running for, for something else. I think you need, I think part of the challenge is, is we don't address those those differences in market about how we're talking about some of how, how the tools are gonna work for us. Yes. And yeah, I don't think I necessarily need to understand how my campus is stitching flows together for anything that's happening in my data center, except for maybe to understand mm -hmm. how my applications are performing. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily need to automate what's happening from a client endpoint all the way down into what's driving down in the server. Now, what I'm doing in my data center may be very different because I may be laying service delivery on top of what I'm providing there. So in that construct, we're dealing with fabrics, we're dealing with you know infrastructure fabrics, and we're not dealing with just sort of client and access ports. So that brings up an interesting point. I mean, do we do we need tools that even bridge those gaps, or are those totally isolated islands that we, we do don't need, need to... I, I do think we do, because you need to understand how application behavior is going from an end user experience all the way back into the data center, which is probably where things are being provisioned, or all the way out to cloud. Yeah. So I think there's things that have to be stitched together, but I don't necessarily think they have to be at the level that we're talking Not about Not the minutia that we're talking about no. when we talk about NetFlow. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you can solve this with other... with with other tools yep. that are available out there. And I think some of that's available today. I think the interesting part is, is, is can you drive how those tools are being managed sure. through that? And that's maybe a yes, yeah. right? Like that, that might be make more sense over time because a lot of the devices that are gonna be out at the edge, especially if we talk IoT, right? <coughs> they're not gonna be a person sitting there. They're gonna be something that you have to, you want to data gather from, or you want to have it do a particular thing for you. Sure. Um, sensors. It's interesting. Reference. It goes back to defining your audience too. I think because you know, I'm quite comfortable not eating and <coughs> breathing networks um, to know that I've just got that 200 OK, mm -hmm. or I might have an Amber Alert that said, "Hey, you've got something unusual in here, or you're starting to hit your capacity." That kind of stuff I'm going to be looking for because if you flood me with information, it's all just going to be noise. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the guys need the ability to drill down into those levels 
of detail when they need them if they really want to get down into what is actually happening um, and that level of detail. So yeah, it really is about going back and defining defining your audience. I think one of the uh, historical arguments that we've always had uh, in enterprise was that whole battle of is it the network or is it the server? Mm -hmm. And anything you can build into a tool that helps me you know, define that argument a wee bit more mm -hmm. into, okay, yes, there is an issue with the network, but is it the network or you know, where is that coming from? Is it right. being generated somewhere else? And I'm, really and I'm really glad Brandon brought up that point yeah, about right. services because most of the services that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis don't exist in a dedicated box. Yeah. Uh, these are software components. They're no longer appliances. And it sort of leads to your point where, um, you know, that blurs the line. Like, like, do we deal with servers and network analytics separately or do we start to blur the line because some of the yeah. connection points like it used to be the connection point was between the server nick and the tor port and that was sort of our dmark but now the dmark is uh, you know a virtual interface inside of the inside of the inside of the box yeah. and it's, it's all no about it's, it's all about optimizing that troubleshooting process i think because mm -hmm. yeah you know, if you can turn around and say okay there is a problem on the network that we've isolated to coming from this particular box but even so more such that it's this thing on this box mm -hmm. um, you know it, as much as you can gather that kind of information to help you pinpoint where to start your troubleshooting without having to go through all those hoops manually first it, it just speeds things up yeah and your key point too is you said optimize that process yeah well I read that as automate that process you know look at what you would do manually and then look at collecting the right data, comparing, contrasting, doing the diffs, and reporting back to exactly what is relevant for, for your environment. Yeah, right. and I think some of the bottlenecks with that is the data itself. Right. Like how yeah. specific is the data to be able to give us that kind of level of troubleshooting because then you have a trade-off. If you're gathering really detailed data, there's an overhead to doing that. So. Sure, sure. Jason, yeah. the proximity of your hand to your glass is making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, it's uh, right, that's it's history a talking to you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's a good that's a good point that he made too though is is you know or that you made I'm sorry that is you know how much data are you gathering right so if you're only gathering data on uh, you know the overlays you know that's fine that's great but it doesn't really tell you what's happening underneath right if you're routing suboptimal or there's some a whole host of other issues right so well, there's the other issue of the fact that the data might not just be not being captured in the right place or in the right context but it also not be of the right format for the right use case. You know, figuring out what overlay tag is being used in a certain session may not be as useful to me as an application developer as, uh, hey, how well is my stuff being transported across your fabric? I don't want to hear about your little numbers. I, I, I care about, you know, server to client, you know, latency, things like that. I don't care about network, network statistics. So I think being able to correlate that data with the application layer is extremely important. I mean, the network folks, they need to see that data too because that's, I think, more, more appropriate to them sitting lower on the stack because those lower numbers sort of impact a whole bunch of other things as opposed to just that one app. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's important to contextualize things um, in detail. And I'm really glad we got to talk about this because it just so happens that my next question sort of just lines right up. Um, my next question, and this is sort of like a leading question to the next one, which is, the, I guess, more important one. Um, the first one is, um, what data are you collecting about your network today um, and why? So just today, don't think about tomorrow, just today what you have configured today. Don't go into your system and start pulling for other things. What are you doing right now uh, and why? What are you doing to look at your network statistics? Whatever up the down. software pulls by default. <laughs> yeah, up, down, uh, bits. Yeah. All right, what do, you, what do you look at then? Let's say it pulls everything. What's important to you? Up, down, utilization, route, AS, origination, or AS path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of it's static data, right? It's we're looking again device by device. We're looking at interface utilization, CPU, RAM, yeah. all of that stuff. So obviously we're always looking for capacity issues. Um, we're looking yeah. for drops and errors. And the problem with all of that is what it, and we're aware of this, is mm -hmm. that it doesn't tell you when an application is experiencing difficulty end to end. Mm -hmm. All I know is that box is fine, that box looked fine, that box looked fine, but end to end we're screwed. I'll throw another wrench in there. <coughs> um, how do you know what's normal? When you look at your statistics, when the, rely on the when the graph is like this, it's normal. When the graph is, like <laughs> <laughs> hey, it works for me. Yeah, Listen, not not being funny, but if you average it well enough, this becomes a straight line. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so so the reason I asked that question is 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 exactly that. I mean, like it's easy to sit. You know, if you have like a small network, I've worked on really small networks, and this is 
it, it's easy to sort of just um, treat this as a binary problem. But at scale, you, you actually get these patterns that are more interesting than just simply, uh, oh, I'm using a lot of bandwidth. It might be normal. It might be Super Bowl Sunday. Um, the opposite might be true. It might be Super Bowl Sunday, and you work for a retail chain. And uh, during the game, everything is just totally dead. And then there's this weird like 30-minute 30, 30 period right in the middle of the game that spikes up. And you can't really explain what, that, what that's all about. Being able to anticipate those kind of surges, I think, is important. So you have to understand. I think this is one of the, one of the things that we could do better at, as an industry is understanding what our baseline is. Like, what is normal? Um, I'm not just talking about throughput or even latency. I'm talking about just from an infrastructure perspective, whether it's networking, whether it's whatever. What is normal to us? What is our behavior? What is our steady state? Yeah, exactly. All right, so that's that's a good way to introduce um, the next question, which is similar. Um, all, assuming all of that, um, what aren't you gathering that you wish you were gathering? What do you not have visibility into today that you wish you did? Just things we're not or things we can't? I'll go with not. So Either okay, one. So, so you mentioned steady state. One of the yeah. things that I have on my my personal list of things to do is to start monitoring routing tables more closely. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the problems is when somebody says something isn't working properly, I have no idea that 30 minutes previously it took a completely different path through the network and out the WAN in order to get there. And that's a bi-directional problem as well, because my path out of my network to somewhere may be different to the path back. Mm. And again, if I, if I can't monitor both ways, I don't know what's changed. And there are some tools out there that will help you do that as well. But, sure. but that's something that, let's say, that's on my personal wish list. Again, it's knowing, it's knowing the steady state behavior. So you uh -huh. can, when something goes wrong, you're like, ah, there was a change here. I have the exact same use case because we made CNN front page the same day Wall Street Journal and I forget who else did. And, and it was something related to what he's talking about. So we're, we're <laughs> tackling the same problem. So yeah, uh, changes, changes in, in the environment, specifically source destination routing, AS path, those type of things, um, do a better job of baseline understanding and then and building uh, alerts that notify when there's a, a unexpected change, which is a lot more difficult than you'd think because things change, things are changing constantly, and identifying what's a normal change versus what's an abnormal change. Um, there's some easy ways to do it, but then there's some tricky use cases that get to be a problem. So, so I think this is a sort of a byproduct of, of dealing with our infrastructure sort of on a node-by-node -node basis, is you expose yourself to those kind of things where there's, there, there are a number of ways to make change on the infrastructure. Um, and it's not, it's not as easy to enforce things at that level. I mean, you can always just turn permissions off for certain people, um, but most people don't. Most people, uh, when, they, when, they, you know, when they set up the administrative use, you know, username for a switch, let's say, that thing will get distributed to a whole bunch of people. I've seen it a billion times, and that's if they're using SSH. If they're lucky, sometimes it's not even that. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's an interesting thing to think about when, instead of administering your network on a box-by-box -box basis, if you can think of your network as a system and say, uh, you know, this, whatever this entity is, we'll just call it, you know, some tool, automation tool that you administer your network through. Um, that's not just about pushing configs in a fast way. I mean, this is one of my biggest beefs with like network automation conversations in general. Inevitably, the conversation turns to speed, which is the least interesting thing to me. Um, what I care about is consistency. Um, almost above all, actually, yeah. I mean, that's basically the biggest thing that I care about is consistently. I don't really care when, how fast the change is made. And you mean consistently good, not consistently bad. Consistently right? <laughs> consistently bad is just as consistent. Right. <laughs> it's consistency. Yes. Right. But I think it's I think it's I think it's important to think about because what that what that means is is that we actually have sat down and thought with discipline about what it is that we're doing with our infrastructure. What what is policy to us? What that does this organization that do? That predicates a different set of tools and a different set of, of of protocols to be able to do some of the things that you're talking about, right? Versus what we have today. Like what? Like how would how would how would it need to change? Um, I, I think there are different things. I mean, some of the industries talking about. Is it, whether you want to do this as in band or out of band, mm -hmm. sort of is one argument. Uh, do you want it fundamentally built into the protocol? So, you know, in band OAM, <laughs> right, could be one, one way to do it. Segment routing could be a different, a different way to tackle some of it. I think there's more interesting models that might come about in, uh, with integration for security models, right? Because I think that's something that's left off the table for many networking people. Is we only worry about our, our fabric and our infrastructure, not what's really running on top. The whole point of what we're building is to run something on top of it. And, and we sort of lose sight of that often. So yes. I think it's, I, th I think we need to do a better job with with w with what we have presented today to sort of move to mm -hmm. that vision. I don't know if we're necessarily as an industry doing the best job there. Yeah. I think there's a lot of 
um, we've done a poor job of getting things through standards bodies, and the standards bodies have really moved to saying open, open source gets to be the way that, that things get moved across the finish line, and you know, hands on keyboards and who writes the code first is going gonna, is gonna to win. Mm. Do they always do the best job with architecture in, the, in advance? Maybe not. <laughs> so I don't know if necessarily that's the right answer, but I will say that it seems to be a structural problem with where we're at today. Um, I don't know if everyone agrees with that, <laughs> especially since some of the folks in the room may be hands on keyboard first, but, <laughs> but, but I think you, know, you get to vote with your feet, but uh, in many cases, um, we may not have done as good a job in the past of being a little slower and mature about right. thinking about how we want to architect a few things. I, I'm all for standards bodies, but they can't take eight years to do every protocol. Oh, sure, absolutely. Right? I agree because with that. Because by the time you know, they finally ratify IP version 6, we're on 10. It, it, that kind of thing. It, it, that, well, that's, it's, become 10, so, okay. it's become <laughs> well, such an onerous process to get anything actually standardized and approved. Everyone goes for the, this is why you get pre-standard stuff coming out. You get companies doing their own versions, their own twists of things before things have been finalized. And then that becomes the standard. Why? Well, because who the hell was going to wait for the standard? Sure. Uh, so, so before this devolves into the, into that conversation, um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that's a great thing to talk about for like five hours, maybe tomorrow, <laughs> with um, a lot more liquid. Yes, but you yeah. touched. Yes, <laughs> but you touched on a point that I that actually leads into my next question. Man, I'm on a roll. Um, <laughs> that I think is important to at least talk about briefly, and that is what is the impact um, for what we're talking about? You mentioned um, standards bodies, st standards bodies versus um, running code, and not necessarily versus, but sort of that whole paradigm. How those two ideas have been interacting. Um, what is the impact with respect to a network automation and then also sort of this idea that the reason we're here, um, network instrumentation, data analytics, that kind of thing. What is the impact of open source software, whether you write it or not, on these ideas? How is that helping or hurting us? <laughs> I think it could be helpful if you have the devs to kind of babysit it, right? But if you look at a lot of the customers that you know, I see it's they got a guy that has a CCMP or something sure. and he just wants to copy and paste a thing and then when it goes, you know, belly up, which it will at some point probably because he's doing something non standard or what it you know, it becomes problematic in that. So I think I mean I think that's almost a little bit of the standards versus open source thing as a whole too, right? Because once it's standardized it's more accessible to everybody or at least in theory versus open source which is kind of this I, it's wizards and guys with capes and stuff that are doing things in, in dark corners. <laughs> yeah. What are you trying to say about We're doing CCMPs? something right. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, well, when all the CCIs get, we get rid of them, you're getting twice as got rid of as everyone else. Well, right? that's fair. <laughs> that's all right, fair. So, so you, said, you said it would be helpful. How would it be helpful? I guess, like, I guess the reason I'm asking this question is what does that allow us as customers? Like, What does this idea of using open source software, whether we're writing it, contributing back, using a project, sort of being you know, participating in that model. I'm not just talking about code, I'm talking about also just like the ecosystem around open source. Like how does that benefit us as customers? Let's assume we have the resources. Sure. I, mean, I, I don't know that on the face of it there's anything, right? It, it, other than the, fast, the, the fact that it's quicker to market, I guess, than standards mm -hmm. bodies, which is right now, I well, think. It's, it's, control, it's, extensible. it's, extens yeah. it's extensible, right? Yeah. So you can, you can extend the framework if you choose to. You can either commit that back or choose not to. Yeah. So I mean, there's, there's structural advantages there. There's certainly a, a cost factor where your investment is not necessarily in a, in a particular ecosystem or, or vendor, but with people and resources to get something done, which is a plus because you can choose to reallocate those resources any way you, you want to. So, I mean, those are big pluses about doing that. You have to be, a, I, I, do, I would argue, you have to be a particular size or a particular type of company to be able to take advantage of that, yeah. right? And there are certain companies where it makes no, fe no sense at all to make a structural investment into people to do open source contributions and to build that. If it's critical to what you do as a, as a web scale company or as a you know a software software first company then yeah it makes it's a great investment people capital to be able to innovate that way or is, is probably the best investment you can make otherwise you can take what other people are doing within that ecosystem and be able to maybe leverage it mm -hmm. once it becomes wrapped with some sort of commercial support so that becomes a more common model that's that next phase up for open source into a mature model, Red being able to pay for something with support. Red Hat did that first, right? In terms of, for, in many ways, right? Sort of innovating that side, and that's what a lot of people are taking as sort of the presumed way that most software 
open source software solutions are going to make it to market, right? Yeah. And I mean, I would I would agree with the, the the point that a lot of what I you know what we've just been talking about is is largely for those folks that um, that operate at, at a certain point that that need those resources that that level of control. Um, at, a, at a at a smaller scale, it really doesn't matter as much because your your risk is lower. I think. Well, so there's there's sort of two interesting constructs today. If you're born in the cloud company that's mm -hmm. consuming AWS only, yeah, or or Azure only, or you know whatever, any other public cloud service offering, your investment should be in smart people developing software. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, right, you don't need any of the other overhead. You really should be spending every dime that you have on, on getting your minimal viable product to market, right, for whatever that's going to be. The other people that have to solve this are cloud scale and web scale shops. And then the what becomes a differentiated value is that in mature markets, it's being able to develop software to your strategic advantage of what you're doing as a business. And that may or may not be open source. Mm -hmm. It also may not be dependent entirely on scale. Yes, uh, it may be true. some. It may be a byproduct of exactly that. What you just hit on the strategy of the business that may just be a, an approach they want to take. And I see that more commonly in like the BI and analytics side, right? So BI and analytics is a differentiating of like I can hire smart people to be able to do interesting things with the analytics of data that we generate as a business, and we can do that, and we can bring forward web dashboards and portals that allow a lot of other people to consume and see what interesting data they can sure. they can gain out of that. Uh, I don't see that happening as much in our industry, with a few exceptions. Uh, Anil will yell at me about this one, but <laughs> all right, his product uh, and what what capabilities are built in there for being able to bubble up a lot of information about uh, out of the both cloud and on-prem on platform, right? And what you can do with that today, because I think that's you know uh, sort of the difference of what do you do with the data that you have and how you're seeing it, and what action you take are decoupled today. Yeah. And I think what's happening is that we're trying to get to the point where we're saying, you know, we should do something with the, with that action set of data that we have and, and couple that more tightly together. And whether that's automation or whether that's, you know, data analytics that actually drives behavior that just self-remediates, um, there's different ways to deal with it. But I think that's, that's where the networking industry needs to start moving towards overall, which is probably your bigger picture of like, look at it as a system, gather data out of it, yep. and then take action on the system if it's needed, or go take action with something else to, to tell it what to do to the system, mm -hmm. right? And I, the, the, the investment in different skill sets, I think, is, is very interesting to me, because I see, I, I see a little bit of a trend or you know, small amount of time that I've been observing this, um, where that's growing, right? We didn't, I don't think that we as an industry were investing as much in these skill sets, uh, uh, you know, being able to have that localized control, call them devs, whatever you want, um, just that, those local resources to do these things. Um, but that's changing a little bit. Like more and more companies are seeing like what, say, the larger players are doing, and that's sort of starting to trickle down. Like at what point do we reach critical mass like at one point, is is that going to either accelerate rapidly or just stop? I mean, do we ever live in a world where all we have is is you know maybe some high level network architects and then devs? Is that a reality, or how does that look? I think that's been the trend for a while, actually. Mm -hmm. Even without you know even without you know anything we're talking about here today, right? I mean, you know, I deal primarily with enterprise customers, and if you look, there's there's typically a whole layer of um, you know, I guess what, CCNP-ish sort of intermediate level people and some entry level people, right? Just within the network team, right? Sure. And then, you know, typically you have only, even at very, very large multinational companies, you'll have only like two or three actual, like in really high level network architects, engineers who are overseeing kind of everything. Mm -hmm. And if they actually need to roll out a big, larger project, that's where those of us in the, in the consulting side get brought in, right? Because we can bring more horsepower uh, to that, but they don't typically staff at those very high levels today. So I don't think that's going to uh, necessarily change a whole lot. You're still going to have to have that that level of architect who knows the intricacies of the protocols and what's going to happen. But you don't need those people to actually monitor the system or, or run the system on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. So what um, we don't have today, though, are those are those devs, all those network devs, right? Right. Again, there's. People hiring, like again, Google, Facebook, Amazon, what have you. But in terms of at what point, you know, do we see a typical enterprise hiring devs for infrastructure? Right. I yeah, I would I would agree. So the the world of having a few high level architects and having a bunch of devs who, I don't see that happening um, ever. Uh, there's 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 too much ingrained 
and and too much resistance to to a lot of that. I've been trying to make that move for years now. Uh, it, this it gets it gets tiresome. We've had these conversations now for I don't know four or five years really uh, that I've been involved in conversations like just like what we're having right now, and I've seen little to no real movement. I've seen talk. I've seen attempts at movement. I've seen <coughs> failure and then reestablishment of silos. Yeah. I've seen that happen far too many times. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. Personally, I love to see it, but I don't. I don't see it happen for most enterprises. I think you you've got this. There's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of uh, <coughs> silos. There's a lot of, and it, it keeps getting reset. That's what I keep seeing happening. Hmm. I think we're going to see it in smaller organizations first. Yeah. Potentially, mm -hmm. you know, again, I've you know coming from you know, East Coast, you know, it could be hedge funds, things like that, where in you know, a high impact small team, and they can ramp up a team of three, four, five guys, and you know, if it's again. Python chops, you know, DevOps, or whatever chops it is, but versus dealing with typical enterprise, and you have these silos, which is going to be long and complicated, where it's going to be the you know smaller, more, more nimble organizations, or at scale organizations. But uh, or yeah, there will we'll be see. pockets, or or the bigger companies will have pockets right, of teams right, that right. do do this, then they deploy yeah. a specific thing, and then that that it, here's what I've if that. Deployment becomes very successful. If people want to know, well, why was that project, that deployment, so successful? And that team had a, had that kind of mentality and that focus, and it was a sh kind of a shorter, agile, Scrum type, you know, team basically, and and they're successful, and everybody else tries to adopt it, and they have this enormous amount of of resistance to that change, to making that change, and and I, I've seen it reset and fail, and so I don't know how you how you kind of take those smaller teams, those smaller organizations, you scale that up, and and you. you, you the the difference between the, the the delta between the beginning and the end of where you need to be to change that whole organization I think is too large. Um, maybe there's stepping stones or something to bridge that gap. I don't I don't sure. I don't know if you see what I'm getting at, but yeah, there's a lot of entrenchment that, that needs to be overcome. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, the reason, I guess the reason I asked the question in general is not necessarily that I think it will happen or that it won't happen. It's more what would be the, I mean, let's just uh, imagine a, a world where that's, where that's the reality. What kind of benefits would we realize? And I think you hit on a lot of those. Um, not necessarily um, like what we would get out of that, but sort of what are the hurdles to getting there, you know? There's also an assumption here, and we talked about silos, that, that we have a network team that has a net ops component. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, if, if we have server team with the DevOps component managing that platform, there's no reason why if the network is truly a resource, that won't just get subsumed into that function. And you might have your network architecture who is your, your guidance and advice to stop stupid stuff happening mm. or doing specialized stuff, but why would you maintain two separate teams? So um, I'll stop asking questions and actually provide a thought of my own for a second. Um, I, I, I think this is... Um, one of the trends that I'm seeing is is a lot of those services that I guess the let's say the application teams have been sort of going through the network team for a long time. Um, I'm seeing a lot of these services f uh, find root in uh, container management platforms or even some of the virtualization platforms. Um, <coughs> Uh, the, the 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 app teams are, are are restless. They want to get things done, and they're willing to go to the network side themselves to make it happen. Um, so there's a skill set jump that's happening. Or, or they'll do it in a server platform. So, for example, rather than spinning up Docker containers and then having to feed config to a load balancer, screw it, we'll run HA proxy and do it ourselves. That's exactly right. right. Why? Because that's within my control. That's within my domain. Exactly. Now, right. if you move the networking function into that bigger domain. Mm. Yeah, maybe they'll do something else instead, but right. yeah, absolutely. They, yeah, they I mean, want movement. And it's happening whether we like it or not. I mean, I'm seeing it all the time. So right. I think, and, and I think so, the, so the one thing about speed, mm -hmm. and sorry to interrupt you, the one thing about speed that you mentioned earlier is, let me say agile again, <laughs> but we need, network is seen as the roadblock, right? It's, well, I can push out a server, I can allocate storage, I can get everything up, and then I've got to wait two weeks for you to set up a firewall roll and turn up a port. Mm -hmm. Right, so there is something about speed in part of that, at least from the provisioning side, especially when you're dynamically spinning up containers anywhere yeah. and trying to hook them into systems dynamically. There's, there's another, another level beyond what we do now that we've got to start being able to do. Yeah. All right, nine minutes. Um, I have one more topic. Uh, I'll skip ahead. I had a few other questions that were sort of similar, but I think we hit on these a little bit. Um, I want to go back to the very important thing that I sort of started all this on. I think this will be a little more, a little more fun because it's sort of like wish list stuff. At least to me, it's really interesting. Um, it may be totally boring to all of you, so we'll see. Um, the idea of testing 
both before and after you make a network change. Um, let's start with let's start with beforehand. Let's start with with uh, pre-change testing. Um, what are what are you guys doing to to validate that the change you're about to make in production is going to be valid? Any, anything, anything at all. What are you what are you doing today to make sure that that succeeds? Raw experience, eyeballs, and <laughs> yeah. copy paste to lab gear. Is yeah, in the ears. Okay, no. Yeah. What, what is this lab of which? Can, can we say ideal? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Test on production. <laughs> test on production, that's right. Yeah. That's the cowboy method, I don't know, right? That's what I'm always right. When I do, I do it in production. Yeah, do it in production. Okay. yeah I would so say if you're lucky enough to have, uh, like we are, a, a fairly large lab that you, yeah. can, you can actually test things out in, Yeah. wonderful, right? You can actually recreate you know, portions of your network that are, that are germane to what you're doing, and, and you, you go on, and you're probably in better shape than almost anybody. Mm -hmm. But how many people actually have? Large, either physical or virtual labs to simulate what they're trying to do. Yes, it's not always practical. Right. So. Right. So, how is that testing done? Is that is that? Uh, do you sort of just do the exact same thing that you would do in production, uh, let's say manually on the keyboard, or how do you how do you deploy that? Well, in in I mean, in my case, what we do with, and we're in kind of a different boat because we're consulting for people, but you know, offering services to people. But we'll actually build up portions of a network. That need testing will actually get them to baseline where uh, you know where they're at today. Um, we'll actually analyze their traffic patterns and we'll uh, you know take an Ixia box and throw traffic at it, yeah. and then we'll do the change in real time with traffic on the network as we expect to see it, mm -hmm. and then we'll look at what happens and how it works after the fact, right? Sure. That same level of traffic, um, but again, that's. I mean, you just mentioned Ixia, and, and instantly you're into like six figures or seven <laughs> figures before you yeah. do anything else, right? So yeah. that's not that's not something that most people are going to necessarily be able to do. Yeah, it does depend very much on the, the type of change you're making, right? If you are making a routing change, it makes sense, and I've done this before, to grab routing tables before and after and diff them and see what changed. Mm -hmm. And did what change? Is, is it what you expected to change? And don't just do it on the device itself, but actually look at down and upstreams, because that's often forgotten. Yeah, you put your static route in here, but you forgot it was being redistributed here, and it's just screwed everything down the line. Um, similarly, yeah, we used to do stuff with, uh, if you're making prefix fixed list changes with BGP peering, if you're adding four subnets, you might want to check that four subnets is how many extra are now being advertised after your change, not 4,000. Right. <clears throat> Would never have done that myself. Um, so it's fairly, but it, it's it's a fairly manual process, right? We, we did look at, um, uh, there was a tool, it could work on anything. I think there was a Juniper tool that would go off and do a bunch of baselines. If you set a config, go grab this, go grab that, and then diff it afterwards. And we looked at do, using that as a default, look, run this before and after regardless and keep the results kind of thing. But mo I, my experience is that most people are pretty shallow on testing. Well, uh, especially just saying, yeah, we're going to do this. How does it work? Well, run a ping. I'm sure it's fine. Sure. How about post? Let's let's go let's go to post test too, because I think there's a lot of similarities here. Anybody doing anything after a change to verify that the change was successful? Or what are you doing? Some of the same stuff, largely. I'll bet. Yeah. I'll, I'll say again, coming from the consulting side, is it's not operating a network, you know, directly. But for those here, they know. You know quite well that I'm a huge fan of Ansible, right? And a lot of times working, with, helping, you know, working with clients to just to capture data back after the change and using some of their built-in modules, like assert is one of them. Yeah. Just assert that this is true. And it's one of those things. Unit testing, you know, it's always done. And just a matter of, you know, you or we all, you know, we all should know what the network should look like at a given state and time after a change. So it should be easy enough to assert that this route exists, assert this VLAN exists, and assert this exists again on this box or the system of device, you know, or the system as a network, whatever we want to call it. And it's extremely, extremely easy to do yeah. to to get started. And that's just one of the things that I advocate is to use those types of assertions, you know, to to validate changes are succeeding. Yeah, I I think that's a great point. Um, and uh, I think. It, it, sort of back to the baseline conversation, we need to do a lot better at understanding what the steady state is um, so that we know what assertions to make. I mean, it's one thing to say, I expect that I'll be able to ping this server. I don't personally know if I was ever able to ping that server, certainly after the change. So it's important to um, it's important to understand where things are, not just from a network perspective, but from an application perspective. What does the application look like today? Um, and tracking that over time so that you can see you know, what 
when, when a change is made, what was the impact of that? It might be subtle, it might be just a little bit of latency. I think it's also important to properly simulate, uh, find ways to simulate real load. Um, we talked about Ixia, Sparent, that kind of stuff. <laughs> There's other ways to do that. Um, I think the tooling could probably improve in this area. Um, which might be interesting. I think it's very important to, to, to focus on, on these baselines and understanding what the actual performance is and not necessarily, well, five switch ports were up before, so I'm good. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any other questions, you know, let me know because uh, I'm, I'm very interested in these topics. But uh, thanks for listening and thanks so much for participating. It was amazing.